when those who put this service together saw that I had chosen that reading for us again, they said, but, but, but we just heard that. So I want to give a shout out to, uh, to my friend Jordan uh, and say it was really a great honor to have Jordan uh, do a series with me this last uh, month. And if you uh, missed that, it's archived on our website. Uh, but it had to do with the parables of the kingdom, several of which you have just heard in the, the reading again. And the reason is because we are... We're going to be continuing. We're going to be continuing with this idea for a little while longer this year because it is very near and dear to, I guess, the, the, the innermost thinking that Chris and I have been doing for quite some time now. And it seems to be that with what is happening in the world today, we uh, as Christians need to be very clear on what Jesus was trying to do when he came here. And so what I'm going to say to transition from that month to this month right now is that what he was trying to tell us is that he has come to set up a new kingdom. That's why he said himself, the kingdom of heaven is here. So as we think about these things, understand that uh, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, remember Mary comes out of the tomb and Mary is there and what does she want to do? She wants to give him a big hug and what does he say to her? Don't touch me. Don't detain me because I have not yet been to my father. Because he wanted to go up to his father and see whether or not the, the, the plan and the execution of the plan had been accepted in the courts of heaven. Literally, the court of heaven. Had his sacrifice been accepted? And so you read in Psalm 24, uh, if you want this afternoon, read 22, 23, and 24, and tell me what you, what you see happening there, because it's interesting when you read all three together. Okay. In Psalm 24, you have this hymn going on. Lift up ye heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. Let the King of glory come in. This is the song that the angels were singing as Jesus was coming up from the grave to be inaugurated as the King of the world. We teach, you've heard many times, Jesus' other name is Adam. Don't we call him the second Adam? Why do we need two Adams? Because you see, the first one gave the world away to the domination of the imposter. And the, the rebel who had already taken one third of the angels out of heaven with his rebellion against God, uh, he came to this earth and he tempted our first parents and Adam said, yes. When Eve came and said, I've already said yes, and it's, it feels good, and I'm not dead. Adam said yes to the evil one. And at that moment, the evil one took over the crown, took it away from Adam. And how do we know this? How do we know that he was a prince of this world? That's what Jesus calls him. In Job, we see him right there at the beginning of Job and he's walking right into heaven with all the other princes from all the other worlds into the council of God. And he is legitimately there. God does not throw him out. He is there and he actually asks for his credentials. Read it yourself. It's right there in the beginning of the book of Job and he says, where do you come from? In other words, where is your province? Where are you a prince? God knew very well where, you know, but he was just checking his ID. And he says, I come from walking to and fro, meaning in my place, this is my territory. I come from walking to and fro on the earth. The earth is mine. The earth is mine. God does not argue with him. He just presents his servant 
Job. Some of you may have been feeling this week that you've gone through a situation like Job. Let's pray together. Let's, let's lift each other up. That's what coming to church is all about as far as I'm concerned. So if you leave here and you still have a heavy heart because of what you're going through, I'm sorry. Uh, please make sure that you talk to me about it if, you, if need be, but find somebody and just tell Jesus about it and, and have that person pray for you. Please, that's what coming to church can be and should be is where we support each other. If you've been having a time like Job had, please don't leave this place feeling downtrodden and feeling un, unheard. Job is part of this world. Job is in this world, but you see, my friends, he worships God. So Jesus comes at the end of what is a very, very long history that you can read in the Bible where he has established himself with with. Abraham, uh, uh, he comes at the end of that as the Messiah and he sets up his, his kingdom. But I'm going to switch gears a little bit on you this morning and you got a little inkling of that when I said what I did about the fact that I'm proud that this uh, organization, Holt International, is an American organization. Because I'm proud of our military as well and I'm proud of the good job that they do in the world today. However... I learned from my brother that the military, what is, the, what is their main job? What is their main, uh, their main focus? Okay, you serve, somebody said serve and protect. I think that's for the police. I, I think the military is there. Here's, here's the phrase. See if you agree with it. To protect American interests. Amen? Am I right? Am I, am I on base? Okay, so when we think of the global economy... <laughs> And, 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 the, and, the, and the, the, the Pacific Fleet is doing maneuvers uh, off of Korea. What are they doing? <coughs> Protecting American interests. Now, what are those interests? Now, my brother, who told me this, uh, works for IBM. It's an American, a big, huge American international company. It is the belief of big, huge American companies that they would like to increase market share. I'm going to talk a little business-like to you right now. Is that not right? Some of you uh, work for big American companies, and you, you know what I'm talking about, and you know that, that uh, the whole stock market thing is built on the fact that we want our, our stock returns to be bigger this next quarter than they were last quarter. So what pressure that puts on to the company is, you've got to increase market share. You've got to sell more widgets. You, you, you've got to grow. All of this is housed in, in, in one word, and, and that word is economy. Our economy. Today, we, we are talking about world order. Okay? And I know that that sounds like a funny way to talk about this, but you just heard a parable about the seed, right? About the sower sowing the seed. And what happens to that good seed, by the way? It sprouts, it grows, and it produces fruit, which makes the farmer happy and rich. Yes. So you are, you must understand that this, this parable is speaking about the economy of heaven. So today, I, I, I'm just wanting you to grab a hold of the fact that this, this could be the Fortune 500 sermon that you'll hear this year, okay? In, in the sense that we're going to talk about, first of all, the American economy where we are interested not only in, in money, but we're also interested in the kind of society that we will have. Somebody mentioned the police. I know the fire are here. Police, fire, these are features of our society that we believe are essential to the kind of life that we would like to live. I was uh, having lunch yesterday with a friend who I haven't seen since I was 15. It's wonderful. It's like a time warp. Edgar, I tell you what, it's like I saw him when he was 15 and now he's 50-something. And I haven't seen him in between. That's crazy. 
That is just amazing. Because I must have looked the same. I mean, he, he, we both agreed we're a few pounds heavier. So that, that was just being uh, modest. Uh, <clears throat> the fact is, the fact is that we, we want to have a certain kind of society. And when Mr. Brown said, let's, let's charge more for gasoline and diesel, and we said yes, because we would get better roads, supposedly, okay, and some other things for apparently the $24 billion that they're going to raise in the next 10 years from that gas increase on Californians. Okay, we said yes to that because that was the kind of life that we wanted to lead. And you're thinking, good grief, Pastor, why, why, why are we talking? Hold, hold everything. Because we believe that coming to this country means that you get to do something that you don't get to do elsewhere. You get to dream a dream. And I don't want to sound hugely political, but I am going to say that America stands today with Lady Liberty in, in New York Harbor saying, come on, come on over, okay? Come on over to this country because you can do stuff here, you can, you can live a life here, you can have a society here that you cannot have back in the old country. I believe that as an immigrant today, that that is still true today in America. That dream that brought my family to this country needs to be alive, I believe, and it is alive when we look at the fact that it started a very, very long time ago with the Vikings. Yes, we now have evidence. I think they came first. And then Columbus came, sponsored by who? Come on, you history buffs. Isabella and Ferdinand, okay, He's Portuguese, by the way. He's not Spanish. So if you want to see his statue, you have to go to Portugal. Okay? He gets to come over here. Why, why are these Spanish money backers sending him to the New World? Why? To get rich. Yes. Gold. Gold. What, what, what does gold help you do? <laughs> Jaden says get rich. Jaden said, you're right, Javen, you're right. It's, it, it, it helps. But then what do you do with those riches? You put clothes on your back. You put food in your mouth. You put a, a car with a good, you know, leather-bound steering wheel in front of you. And, 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 and. Because of... Riches, which the Lord has blessed this country with. A lot of us only work 40 hours a week. And we think that's harsh. We're, we're looking at those guys that only work 25 hours a week and saying, that's the life I want. But if you do remember, we come from people who had to work from sun up to sun down, and sometimes they got up before the sun to milk the cows. Why do you think we still meet at 11 o'clock on Sabbath morning? Because you had to milk the cows before you came to church. That's the only reason that 11 o'clock seems to be sacred in this society. There's no need in our modern society to say that we have to meet at 11 o'clock. We could meet at 3 o'clock. Amen? Any amens out there? Okay, all right, just, just checking. Because Chris and I have actually tried to do this, and, and it's actually difficult to get people out of the rut of coming at 11 o'clock. But reason why we come at 11 is because of cows. <laughs> and chickens. And whatever you had to do on the farm. We don't live on farms anymore. Well, some of us do, but... We still do that because there was a time when you needed to make room in your life for your chores before you could come to church. And we get worried when we have to work long, long hours. We want to be paid lots of, you make me work more, I better get more money. And then we think of those people who take lots of vacations, we think they're so lucky. But you know, it is because of our American economy, our American technology, the kind of lifestyle that we are living, that we actually have so much time off. 
you think, I, I don't have much time off. Yes, you do. When you think of other nations that go to school longer, yes, you school children, you, you should know 200 days of school is, 180 days in America is not like the 200 in some other countries and in Japan, 220 days of school. So we wonder why our children don't get as much. Well, there's the reason right there. Okay, and America is thinking about changing that, by the way. I don't know if that's a yippee yay yay from the parents or a, oh no, more school. I don't know. But uh, yes, we have the ability to send our kids to school. We have the ability to, to educate them so that they get these jobs that we like. And then, I mean, they study science and math and literature and business and they become part of our society that we work very hard to put together. But here's, here's the piece that I want you to, to hear very well this morning. Guess what? This economy does not stretch much further than America. And even in America, not everybody gets to play. So as hard as we have tried as Americans to set up a society that is helpful and loving and kind and that ostensibly was a place where you could practice your religion the way, whatever way you wanted to practice your religion and, and there was freedom and, and justice for all. We also put in there something about the pursuit of happiness, didn't we? Yeah, I saw that movie. And yeah, I think that most of us and most Americans today are still pursuing. If you had to ask them, I don't know how happy they are right now. But, you know, you could say, I live a good life, I live a good life. But when you think to yourself, how far, how far does that stretch around the world? Well, I've got sad news for you. It doesn't go very far. Because the economy and the thinking behind it uh, does not include making a life like we have for other people. In fact, uh, uh, sad news to tell you, uh, we live the life that we do because uh, there are some large corporations that make sure that there are people in other parts of the world that stay the way they are and get paid what they get paid because then we can have the cheap stuff that we want. Sorry to say that, but but I, I'm not going to name any companies that do that, but you can find out for yourself. And so if you are into any sort of justice issue concerning what you wear, and let me tell you, those under 25 in the hearing of my voice are into those kinds of issues. And they're going to want to know if you, as a Christian, care about the people who made your clothes, about the people who made your coffee, about the people who made things for your life. Okay, and so there's a, a huge movement of people who are now saying, I am only going to buy from companies who care about people. I didn't ask them to do that. Jesus may have asked them to do that. They may believe in Jesus, I don't know. But there are now companies that are taking this mandate seriously in our country today, and I salute them. I salute them because it means that more people around the world are being enfranchised into this better life that we are living. Some things come across my feeds. One of them that came across my feed this week was water.org. You know him as Matt Damon. He has an organization called water.org and he is into getting water from more places that don't have it. In fact, with this whole Me Too uh, thing that is going around for women who have been abused, the spotlight has now become bigger, and I'm so glad that it has, because it, it is amazing to realize how many women around the world have to go for water. You can change the life of a, an entire village full, full of women if you just bring water to that village. You can change the life of those people. They get education. They, they have less children. They, 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 they can read and write, and therefore they can know how to get medicine for their children, food for their children. Just putting a well in can change the trajectory of an entire area. 
Um, there's an organization a friend of mine in Canada has called A Better World. A young lady seven years ago decided after visiting Afghanistan that she wanted to see kids go to school, especially girls. And so she came to A Better World and she said, uh, look, I would like to start a project to put a hundred classrooms, a hundred more classrooms into operation in Afghanistan. Will you let me do that? And to this day, she has raised over $1.2 million. Uh, they're in the closing stretches now. And when she finishes the next school, they're building two more schools. They will not have a hundred. They'll have 101 classrooms that they will have built and that they will have given the, the, uh, crayons and the pencils and the paper too. Her name is Azalea Lendhoff and uh, I want to give a shout out to her and her project that started in 2010. I learned this week too that if you want to know what, why the Gateses, how many of you know about the Gates Foundation? Okay, why do the Gateses give their billions to the things that they give it to? Why? Because they've got 1,500 people around the world who are looking for what it is that they can do to help humanity. Do you want to know where they gave their money? Just go to gatesnotes.com and it'll tell you what is going on with their foundation. And it's worth looking at because it says, this is the kind of world in which we would like to live. They're crowing right now because they had the opportunity to help in the last 20 years. They have halved the infant mortality rate in this world. Used to be 20 million. Now it's only 10 million. Can you live with 10 million? Well, they're happy that it's only 10 and not 20. And there, there are people, I couldn't believe it, who had the audacity to say, well, why are you doing this? In other words, shouldn't you just let those people die because this planet is going to become overpopulated? Well, thank God there was a professor that they work with who unfortunately just passed away who helped them to understand that when, <laughs> when you help a child to live to the age of five, You decrease the population. And I say, how do you do that? Well, guess what? There are moms and dads just like you and I in the world who have more children because they know that some of their children are going to die. Some of them just aren't going to make it. And if you, so therefore, if you keep more of their original children alive, they end up not having so many. So yes, the Gateses are into contraception. And you think, oh, yes, they're into spending hundreds of millions of dollars in helping women to keep the population of the world in check. That's education, and that's helpful to the planet. The planet, people. I mean, how many times did you think about the planet this week? Well, when you're Bill and Melinda Gates and you have billions and billions of dollars, you think about the planet. You don't just think about America. Well, here comes Jesus. Chris, help me out here. Jesus comes to this world with a plan. Don't worry, we, we, we rehearsed this just this morning. <laughs> Jesus comes as the plan of salvation to this world and he is this tiny, tiny thing. So the picture on your bulletin this morning is of an acorn and right behind it, kind of in, in the background, is the huge oak tree that it becomes. Part of the principles of the kingdom is that if you, you got to start small, you got to be a seed, but one day you are going to be an oak tree, you're going to have this huge, big thing. We, we decided, though, that we needed to couch the next few weeks in the form of the temptations of Jesus, and Chris is going to tell you about that. So just to put some context together, 
It is now. Okay. <laughs> to put some context to um, what we're talking about here and the temptations of Jesus. And in January, um, Pastor Mike went through the Beatitudes. And in February, he and Jordan went through some of the Kingdom of Heaven parables. And these are all things that have to do with the kingdom of heaven in different ways. The Beatitudes is kind of Jesus' statement on uh, how you, be, you enter the kingdom of heaven, the progression um, as you grow into the kingdom of heaven. And the parables are all little stories or vignettes or uh, little visuals uh, of different characteristics of the kingdom of heaven, what the character of the kingdom of heaven is, how you get it, how you keep it, um, how valuable it is. These are all found in Matthew 5 to 7 and in some of the other Gospels as well. And this, uh, all that whole Matthew 5 to 7 section is basically what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus' words uh, of what his plan is. He's basically sort of giving his treaties or his Magna Carta or his platform or his rollout, however you want to put it. Uh, this is what he's here for. This is his purpose in coming to the world and introducing the kingdom of heaven. So if you have some time and you want to read through Matthew 5 to 7, you get in a big concentrated chunk. This is what Jesus is here for. And it's some heavy stuff, let me tell you. But And we're going to be going through more of it as we go on. But if you back up a chapter to Matthew 4, you see the beginning of Jesus' ministry that happens just prior to when he does the Sermon on the Mount. And, of course, you know he was baptized, and then immediately goes into the desert and is tempted. And there's so much symbolism and so much um, foreshadowing, you might say, of what the kingdom of heaven is in, in what happens in those temptations. And there's lots and lots that have been uh, written about it, and there's lots and lots you can pull out of it, but this is just sort of a, a basic idea. So Jesus is about to introduce his kingdom, and he is basically saying, my kingdom is going to be upside down to the kingdom of this world. So the devil comes up to him, and he says, as Pastor Mike said before, he's won this fair and square from Adam. There's no argument over the fact that the devil is in control of this world. He has won it fair and square. He comes to Jesus and he says, I know why you're here. You want it back and I'll give it to you and all you have to do is these three things. So why was it even a temptation for Jesus? I've thought that back in, in my life. Why was he even tempted? But if you think about this is what Jesus came to do is to get this world back, then it was a temptation because he did want the world back. But it was the wrong kingdom. It was the kingdom of the world, and this was how the devil plays his kingdom. And he was saying, I'll give it to you on my terms. And Jesus' answers in all of these temptations is the kingdom of heaven principles, which are upside down to what the devil is doing. So you have these three main symbols. You have the bread in the first temptation, you have the temple, and you have the mountain. And as we go through these, uh, we'll do the bread today and... And then uh, next week is the temple, and then there'll be a, a week's break, and then it'll be the mountain. And then the final week of March is actually a, a coalescing of Passover, Easter, and communion. It just all happens on the same time. And it is actually the culmination of all of these symbols, and the whole kingdom of heaven comes together on that day. And we're going to do something special for that. So I hope you'll be here for that. Amen. So, the bread is a symbol of the physical aspect of man. We all have physical needs. It's not just hunger, but we have you know, the shelter, food, <coughs> clothing, all of these things that we need materially. And it's also, it can be correlated with economic power, which Pastor Mike has just been talking about. So the devil comes to Jesus with this temptation, and he's saying, you can have economic power. And then the next one is the temple, which is a symbol, of course, of the religious powers, the spiritual aspect of man. And we all, of course, have a desire, a hunger for God that we experience and feel in different ways. So he came and he gave him a temptation spiritually that he would have the, the religious power of the day in that temptation. And then the third one, on the mountain, when he asked him to worship him, that he will give him, um, <coughs> give him the kingdom, that was a... a power uh, that was a temptation for political power and I like to think of this as the relational aspect of man or woman I shouldn't just use man um, of people because we all have that relational aspect and God has been very clear on how our relationships are to each other that you know here's God and here's us and here's the earth 
but we tend to get those things all mixed up and we put them in different places and we worship each other and we worship the earth and you know all kinds of things and so that was the temptation for that so as we go on through these three symbols of the temptations that will give you some context as how Jesus takes each of these three things the religious power the economic power and the political power of this world the way the devil has set it up and he just completely turns it upside down and makes his own upside down kingdom that's why we've called it the uh, thank you love that's why we've called it the upside down kingdom is because that is exactly what it is now if you have not if you have not uh, thought of it this way and it's it's really new um, do what Chris has said and, and read Matthew 5 6 and 7 again this afternoon or maybe study it for your devotions this week but I'm going to ask you at this point to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6 if you would like and um, the reason is because it's time, time sensitive. I, I, you, you've been so gracious to give me the time that you have so far, and I don't want to go uh, too much further, but I want, to, want you to grab a hold of today. The symbol for today is bread. Okay? This is an artisano loaf. You can see through the, the light that it's nice and fluffy. It smells good. Okay? If you want some after, I'll give you some. Okay? You heard Chris say that the bread symbolizes economic power. And yes, that is why I started this by talking about the economy. And I started this by saying that America today is really an attempt, let's say, by our forebears to set up an economic situation of a different sort to what they had come from. Yes? Do you understand that? And that's the parallel that I'm trying to make is that Jesus comes now and he comes into our world, and he has come to set up a new economy. And that economy is going to have rules, it's going to have uh, uh, products that it, it, it's looking for, it's going to have rule, you know, w ways in which we act. So first of all, first of all, that economy is symbolized by, by bread. Now, I want to connect in your minds again that for 40 years, what did God do for the people of Israel? Fed the manna, manna. So uh, let's not forget that this was God's teaching device about his kingdom with his people. He teaches them that he will provide. Uh, the, one of the names of God that we, we love to sing about and that we, we, we often talk about is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is the name for God. He is God the provider. This is what he does for 40 years for the people of Israel. And the Bible also says that their clothes did not wear out. And their shoes did not wear out. And their tents did not wear out. So God performs this miracle for their clothing and for, and, and for what they had with them. And then he also gives them uh, breakfast, lunch, and supper every day in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, this sets up not only an educational piece for the people of Israel as to how God would like us to know about him, but it also means that when Jesus comes, he says, what does he say? I am the bread of life. You see how this is beginning to fit together. So, so you have also then the, the, the second thing that we must not forget in John chapter 6 is the feeding of the 5,000 5, 5, men, right? Sorry, ladies. Um, I always say sorry when that parable comes up because they didn't count the ladies or the kids. So I like to say the feeding of the 15,000 or 20, okay? It was a lot of people. And then there's another time when Jesus feeds 4,000 people. This is not, by the way, just to show that he can provide bread. It's what he does, but here's the kicker. Who picks up the leftovers? Jesus' disciples. He wants them to know specifically about what is happening and that, that this, this is one of the ways in which Jesus announces his new kingdom. He is the Messiah and he will provide. And in fact, there are those who say it was very specific that he did it with five loaves. 
that this was significant, that he did it with five loaves, okay? So we've got, a, we've got manna, we've got the feeding of the 5,000, and then I want you to also connect together one other situation that comes in Luke twenty-two nineteen, where Jesus is at table with his disciples, and what does he do? So now, when we come to the end of the month, this is another advertisement for the fact that once in seven years... Passover and Easter happen on the same weekend. Very, very fun, very, very interesting. So we are going to have a Passover Easter Sabbath. And on that Sabbath, we are going to have people who will participate on your behalf, and then afterwards you'll be able to taste the stuff. We're going to have a Messianic Seder. And at the same time, we will, you will be able to see the pieces of that meal that have come out of that meal that we celebrate in communion every time we do communion. So if you haven't had this experience and you want to know, you know, what cup did Jesus say, drink this, this is my blood? What cup did he say, I'm not going to drink that cup? What? It's confusing, right? Okay, if you're confused, be here on the last Sabbath of this month and you will learn more about why we do what we do in communion. And in fact, it will be like a communion service on that Sabbath, okay? So just know that that's coming. So manna, feeding of the 5,000, Passover is this culmination when the bread of life is broken for you and for me. So this is, this is very, very symbolic, okay, um, uh, uh, of recognizing who the Messiah is. Okay, here's the fun one. Uh, the two guys walking uh, down the road after Jesus has, has been resurrected, after he's died, buried, resurrected, they're walking down the road to Emmaus. Jesus has his hoodie up and he walks with them. What happens? He tells them about the Messiah beginning with, with, with the, Moses and the prophets, and he tells them the whole story. And what happens to their hearts? Burns with, oh my goodness, why didn't we know this? This is amazing stuff. And, and, and then he's going to go past their house, and they, and they say, no, 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 come in, come in, you can't go on, you've got to stay with us tonight. Wait for it. They get to table, and what does Jesus do? He breaks the bread. So this, again, becomes a, a sig signal system of saying, I am the one. I am the one who is coming into the world to begin this new economy. Let me put it to you simply. We often talk about works and grace. Grace is this new economy. When you talk about paying for our sins, aren't you talking in monetary language? Well, guess what? The old system was, if you did something wrong, you had to pay. The new system is, Jesus paid it all. He's introducing that system that was foreshadowed with the whole sanctuary system. All those lambs that they would kill for sacrifice, that was all to do with Jesus. That economy that they had with all the rules, that was all to do with Jesus. It was all pointing towards Jesus. And that is why he makes a big point about saying, I am the bread of life. And basically he is saying, come and be a part. Eat, eat, put this into you. It's almost like having a, you know, a new hard drive. Put, put this into you so that you too can be a part of my kingdom and that you can operate in the way that you will need to, while you are living in this world, David says, the valley of the shadow of death, you too can be a part of my economy. You can be a part of my, of my kingdom. Okay? Uh, Jesus tells this to the people in John chapter 6. This is another piece that we won't go into as, in as much detail as I would have liked to today, but... He basically says, you have to drink my blood and eat my flesh. Ooh. You know, 
Don't make me say Santa Clarita diet because, oh, I shouldn't say that. Okay, so, you know, here's the thing. The people were not understanding. So now you understand maybe a little more how they felt at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And now they understood. And the fact that we, too, should be praying for the latter rain. We should be praying for the infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we will understand the economy and the way in which God would like us to live within His economy now. So the bread of life. I'll just, I'll just simply hold it up to you and say, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You need to take me in and, and, and it needs to be digested in you and, and become part of you and become the operating system that, that drives you in this world instead of a system that we have in this world where there are haves and have-nots. Do you see why I made such a big thing about our, well, we can call it the world economy? Because in the world's economy, there are always going to be haves and have-nots. You participated this morning with Holt International, whose sum total idea is there are some have-nots that have been thrown away. Would you please help them to have a little? Is that, is that right, Pam? Is that, is that about sum it up? That, that sums it up. Okay. And when you, when you give from the abundance that God has given you to someone else, you are not living according to the economy of this world. You are buying in. You have, you have taken in Jesus. You have taken in the bread of life. And you are now breaking the rules of this world which say there are going to be some haves and there are going to be some have-nots. And I'm the have and I'm going to keep it that way. When you give to someone else from the abundance that God has given you, you are breaking those rules. Why do you, why do you think, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this about Santa Clarita, but why do you think that it has taken them so long to come up with the, uh, the little piece of land on Drayton Avenue that they have now given to an organization that, that we're going to interact with by giving 60 sack lunches tomorrow. Why do you think it's taken them so long? Because they don't want to admit that we have homeless in Santa Clarita. They don't want those people in our midst. But the fact is, my friends, a lot of those people, definitely the people that we help when we do family promise here in this church, they are our neighbors. Their kids are going to our school. They just happened to run out of money so they couldn't pay the rent, and now they're living in their car. The rules say, sorry, too bad for you. Go somewhere else with your problems. Jesus comes along and says, you know what? I died for that person. They have value to me. They need to eat. They need a place to stay. And when you do something for them, you are doing it for me. Those are the rules of the kingdom of heaven. Guys, it's an incredible journey. You can tell that, 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 it, that it has made a huge impact on, on, on our lives, Chris's and my life. And I, I, I'll tell you that, that uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to say yes to Jesus. In John chapter 6, when he said, you have to eat my body and drink my blood, most of the people left. So if you leave, you'll be in good company. Because Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter, you know, he had to say something because he just always had to say something. 
He said, if we leave you, where, where are we going to go? We got nowhere else to go. So we might as well stay with you. <laughs> Can you imagine that's what he said to Jesus' face? That's what he said to Jesus' face. You're, you're our last resort, man. Oh, well. <laughs> but it's not easy. It's not easy to sign up to be a rebel against the, 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 the economy of this world. It's not easy. Because we're all, and I'm chief of these people, it's all so easy to listen to, to all the cries to do like society does. So we're going to have to be very careful. We're going to have to be very crafty, very interested in how the Holy Spirit will influence each one of you and me as we go out into this week. And we take in the bread of life and we say, okay, God, lead us, lead us now. And he starts veering us over into a place that we're very scared to go, uh, a conversation maybe we don't want to have or, or a relationship we don't want to repair or you know, some, something we have to say sorry for and we don't want to do it. And he says, no, you need to do this because, because this is what the kingdom of heaven is about. As he does that, I want you to know he is going to go with you. He is going to go with you and he is going to empower you in the, in the, with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the latter rain. That's the latter rain that we need to be praying for. His power to be living examples of what it is to be part of God's economy right now in the valley of the shadow of death. That we fear no evil because he is our shepherd. Amen. Amen.